Ladies and gentlemen of IDFA, start your powerful dairy engines. Welcome to the President's Breakfast, here to keep us on track as we explore the power of dairy is IDFA's Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, Carrie Fry. Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. And welcome to those of you joining us live stream. Our live stream is brought to you by International FC Stone. We'd also like to thank the President's Breakfast Sponsor, Clarion Lubricants. We're really grateful to all of our sponsors. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Michael Dykes. Many of you already know about his distinguished career in government affairs, also agriculture policy expert and veterinarian. But perhaps you don't know that Michael grew up on a small dairy farm in Kentucky. His knowledge of the business world combined with his experience as a veterinarian has given him a unique perspective for the whole dairy industry. That's why he's worked so hard to remove obstructive tariffs that harm both dairy farmers and dairy processors, and why he's also fought so hard for the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. He has incredible insights into Wall Street, international government affairs, and he knows firsthand what it takes to get up every morning at 4 a.m to bring dairy products from the farm to your kitchen table. IDFA is very fortunate to have the benefit of his business acumen and his down-to-earth experience. Michael truly exemplifies the power of great leadership. Please join me in welcoming Michael Dykes. Thank you, Carrie. It's not hardly 4 a.m., but maybe it feels like it to some of you. You may have been at the bar a little too long last night. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you to all of you around the world that are watching via live stream. This morning, it's just wonderful to look out there and see the excitement and the energy and to see it last night after the, at the receptions. And speaking of last night, did you enjoy last night's speaker? What, what, an, what an amazing guy. You know, the other thing about t today in the Dairy Forum is we have farmers here with us in the audience today. And it all starts with you. It's where the milk comes from. We have processors who turn the milk into valuable, nutritious products for the consuming public. And we have the retailers who put those products on the shelves and makes it available to the consumers. And we have the suppliers, the manufacturers, the financers who provide the capital. And together, you make up the dairy industry. And the dairy industry is in this room this morning, all 1,147 of you, a record for Dairy Forum. As Carrie said, I grew up as a kid milking cows in Kentucky. Spent six years with my left arm up the rear end of cows, about 200 times a day. Was involved in the launch of RBST for dairy cows. I absolutely love this industry. It feels like family. It is, it is a wonderful, wonderful industry. But you know, as I reflect from my days of milking cows, and my days of doing rectal exams, and to where we are today, we have seen a lot of change in this industry, a lot of change. And last year at Dairy Forum, I talked about change. 
And I don't know about you guys, but I think we've seen a little change in our dairy industry in the last couple, three months. Significant change. But I also have other news for us. We're going to continue to see change. And we're going to see more change in the next five years, in my view, than we've seen in the last 15. So get ready, buckle up, and we need to get ready to embrace change because it's not just our industry that's changing. And it's not just change, but change is getting faster, coming at us quicker, decisions more, more, more nimble. And it's not just our industry, as I said, but our world is changing. We're in a very dynamic time in history with the way things are changing. Let's take just a quick look at some of the changes that are happening in our world. We don't have to think back too many days ago till we were on the brink of what appeared to be the brink of war with Iran. Fortunately, fortunately, that was averted. 2019 wasn't the best of times for production agriculture on the farm. Prices weren't the best for dairy. If you're in the row crop business, it was wet, tough getting crops planted. For those who fortunately get them planted, early winter is tough getting them harvested. Things weren't easy. We've talked about China and the power of China and the importance of China in our lives and the importance of China to our trade relationships. And we have a lot of protests around the world. Think about Hong Kong, think about Venezuela. So there change all around us. We're in the midst of impeachment for our 45th president here in the, U in the U.S. If there's one thing about the impeachment that I hope all of you noticed, is there's two drinks for the U.S. senators while they do impe impeachment. One is water, and the other is milk. So at least dairy is getting a mention in all this. <laughs> Maybe one of the most valuable pieces of it. Uh, if we think about our own country, we're at a time of significant partisan bickering. Democrats say it's high noon. Republicans say, no, they're all crazy. It's midnight. Polar opposites. 2020 is a big year for our nation. We have an election coming. All the members of the House of Representatives are up for election. A third of the U.S. Senate is up for election. Many of the states are up for election. We have a census which will determine which states get how many representatives in the House of Representatives. Populations are shifting, they're changing, they're moving. And I say if we look at our country today, most of our food is produced in the red America and consumed in the blue America. So that means that all of us in this room have a tremendous educational opportunity ahead of us. We cannot assume that the folks that are consuming our foods know what we do on our farms, in our processing plants, and in our retail institutions. We have to educate them. We've got to tell them. And that will take the efforts of all of us. So change is also happening, not just in the world, not just in our country, but we've also made changes at IDFA. We've changed our structure, our governance structure. We were four entities, four separate bylaws, four different audits. We've streamlined that to one entity, the Executive Council, with five segment boards so that we have a place for everyone in the dairy industry. Fluid milk, cheese, ice cream, yogurt, cultured products, butter, infant formula, ingredients. We've changed our committee structure along with that as well. And thanks to all the members who are participating in our, in our committee meetings, uh, at this year's Dairy Forum and our Economic Policy Committee, we have 60 individuals signed up. We're looking at federal milk marketing order reform. Do you think there's a little interest in that topic, maybe? If we think about other changes that we've made, we've had to change our focus. We've focused on trade, and fortunately for our industry, the last few months have been very positive for trade. We've seen the passage of the USMCA, We've seen the signing of a deal with the U.S. and Japan, signing of a deal with the U.S. and China, four of our top five markets, four of our top five. China has the potential to be a $23 billion market for U.S. dairy in 10 years. 
if we get the relationships right. We've been collaborating across the industry. When I came here, I brought a theme, a view, a vision of increased collaboration, increased trust. We've worked with USDA and with new coalition partner, Feeding America, and with MilkPep to encourage USDA to do, for the first time ever, purchase fluid milk for food banks. Over the last couple years, we've had $253 million of purchases of dairy products by the U.S. government, going to food banks, going to those who need it most, and hopefully as a result of that, we may generate a new generation of milk drinkers, of people who like dairy and see positive things with dairy. We're also pleased, I think Jim Mulhern's here this morning with the National Milk Producers Federation. Known Jim for many years, very pleased to see our organization collaborate with National Milk and make changes to the federal milk marking orders in the last farm bill. Doing things that people said would never ever be done, but because you guys all came together, you worked together, you sought mutual interest, we we're able to do things. The other thing we're working on is aligning federal funding with the federal policy. We're trying to get dairy as a part of the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, the old food stamp program. Fruits and vegetables are always viewed as things that we need from a policy perspective to encourage more consumption of. So what we're trying to do is get dairy seen as good for you so that we want to see encouragement of increased consumption of fruit, vegetables, and dairy. We have a million dollars appropriated for that in our next fly-in. We will be working on getting additional appropriation. We're using this as an opportunity to leverage the diversity of our membership. Our retail members are working with our processing members and we're working with third parties to do pilot, a couple of pilot project, projects around the world so that we can collect data to show that this program will actually work and will actually bring benefit. We need the expertise of the retailers on how do you do SNAP transactions at the grocery store. Gives us credibility. We're also working on research. We have appropriated funds of $3 million for USDA Agriculture Research Service to do research on ice cream products that don't make it into the final product. I firmly believe 20 years from now there will be value in that, in that stream much like the waste stream of today. So we talk about change. We've seen change. Change is here. We have some decisions to make as an industry. We can resist it. We can act like it's not here. We can cling to the past. In, in agriculture, we have sometimes have a tendency to do it the way we've always done it. And once you have children, you get asked that question all the time. Why do you do it that way? And sometimes you run out of answers because it's like, well, short answer is because we always have. We can em embrace it, we can help it evolve, we can lead it, but we cannot stop it. We cannot stop it. It's gonna happen. And I think Henry Ford said it best, if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always gotten. So, Perhaps, if you like what you've always gotten, and you like where you are today, maybe you keep doing what you're doing. But if you have a view of a better future, if you have a view of better things to come, and if you recognize that change is coming, you should participate in that and help lead it, rather than let someone else determine that for us. Let's take, a, let's take a look at two companies of how they address change and how they thought about change. Two names that everyone in this audience is familiar with, Kodak and IBM. So if we think about Kodak, all of us remember the days of film, getting film developed, and cardboard boxes full of family photos. Uh, in 1975, Kodak engineer came forward to the management team and said that he had invented a way to have a digital camera. Management team said, go away. We are the world leader in photographic film. We don't want any digital cameras. 2012,
Kodak declared bankruptcy. They missed the technology shift. If we take another look at, at another company, IBM. IBM was the leader in computers. They had the PCs loaded with Microsoft Windows. They were at the top of the world. Then the PC clones came in, same Windows, cheaper components, undercut them on price, took the margins out, made it a volume game. And in 1993, IBM declared at that time the largest corporate loss of any corporation at $8 billion. So they had to ask himself, what business are we in? What's our future? And what change do we need to make? So they abandoned the PC, purchased IT service companies, and became a solutions provider. A new business. They asked himself, what business are we in? And you see their ads on service on, on TV today. So they're helping people collect data analyze data, make decisions from the data. So, change is here. We see its power in these examples, these two companies. We see what happens when you embrace it. We see what happens when you don't embrace it. We need to lead it. We need to get in front of it. We need to help, we need to help uh, determine our future. Our dairy industry, too, is evolving. We're undergoing change. Everyone in this room knows it. We were, still are, will be a gallon of milk wrapped in plastic with a different color lid. We talked about that at Dairy Farms a few years ago. But we've got to think beyond the jug of milk to other things. We've used whey protein. We've done the whey protein bars. We're now coming with protein. If you look at the, at the buckets of the, on the, each of your tabletops, I think you'll see protein, protein, protein. We think a glass of this new drink, it's a fruity smell, with a, with a, with a, found in a lot of gyms, has as much protein in it as one of the bars, as much protein in it as a glass of the milk. These are different futures for some people in the room and, and for the foreseeable future always will be. We'll also see new products emerge, and again, you're seeing that. So if we take a look, a little deeper dive at our dairy industry, I'm going to just show you a few of the examples. There are many. The refrigerator out front has many. The tables have many, and there are many, 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 many more I could do. With new technology of filtration, we're doing, double, we're doing twice the protein, half the sugar, extended shelf life. Value-add products. We have another new one on the chocolate milk front, lower sugar, aluminum can, shelf stable. We're seeing companies embrace the disruption with a blend of animal protein, dairy protein, and plant protein. Notice the focus on calories and protein. We're seeing other changes in our ice cream and embracing the low carb of consumers. Cottage cheese with flavors different flavors in our yogurts, different ways to present cheese. We've had the, we have balanced breaks mixing cheese with nuts and fruits, trying to find more occasions to consume dairy. We're seeing an increased marketing focus on our cheese through Costco with the cheese, different cheeses in the cheese flight. And this last year was a great year for U.S. dairy. Rogue River Creamery Blue Cheese won the World Cheese Contest, World Champion Cheese. So we are no longer just a major exporter of cheese, we are also a leader in cheese, high value cheese. A great IDFA member doing a great job and I've talked to the company and their, their company has exploded. The world's been turned upside down since they won the World Cheese Prize. Amazing what these kinds of things do. No longer are we second place to our European neighbors. We can hold our heads high with quality products. It is for this reason that I'm a believer that we have a very good story to tell. And we've been working to tell the story, especially in the last few weeks 
as the media wants to paint the story with the changes that we've seen in the fluid milk category that our dairy is dying and that things are horrible for the U.S. dairy industry. Don't believe that's true, and we're trying to get the story out there. If we look at, at dairy consumption since 1975, USDA data, dairy consumption has been increasing. We've had 22% growth over that time period. Some of the reporters will say, yeah, that's true, Dykes, but, well, I tell you what, the last decade's not been too good for you. Well, it's not true either. We're doing well in the last decade. So why do we see this? Why, why do, I asked myself the other day, why do we have such a hard time convincing these guys of this, and why are they so set on writing these stories? And I think part of the issue here is the way we are consuming our dairy is changing. And for most reporters, they see dairy as a glass of milk that you drink. So if we're drinking less, then dairy must be dying. Dairy must be going in the wrong direction. But as you can see here, we're consuming our dairy in other ways. We're eating more of our dairy. We're drinking our dairy as yogurts. What's driving this change? The consumer. And that's one thing that I think our industry is coming around to recognizing is the consumer is our boss. We all have the same boss. We all work for the same person. Whether we are a dairy farmer, whether we are a dairy processor, or whether we are a retailer, the consumer is our boss. And these guys are changing on us. They change their eating habits. We talked last year about cereal consumption going down and how milk came along for the ride. We don't sit and eat breakfast like we used to. We don't have two eggs and bacon and a glass of milk. And then we move to a bowl of cereal. Now we're grabbing something, we can run out the door, eat it, drink it while we're driving. So if the consumer is our new boss, like in any place, we have a new boss, one of the first things we want to know is what does our boss want? What is our boss like? So we know that consumers from research value health and wellness, especially in terms of cardiovascular health and weight maintenance. Bless you. It's a sign you're growing. Uh, they're going for low carb. And you can see as an example, we have that on the table. They're going for higher protein. You see that as well in our, new, in our products. And the beauty of those things is dairy has a great story to tell. We are a protein product. We can appeal to those consumers. Affordability and safety. Safety is absolutely paramount. We have to have food safety. And I can say with all sincerity, from visiting well over 100 of our IDFA processor members, you each and every day work diligently to make sure you're putting the safest product out there for the consuming public. An extraordinary effort on safety. We got to continue that. And affordability, we're blessed with the cheapest food supply, safest food supply, most wholesome food supply of any place in the world and consumers continue to expect it. Ability to meet specific nutritional or value-based characteristics. Value-based characteristics, a little tough to define, but consumers want to consume food with a story. It's more than just nourishment. Where did my food come from? How far did it travel? Was it, what kind of farm was it, did it come from? Did they care for their animals? Did they do it in a sustainable way? I want no red meat. I'm a vegan. I want GMO free. I want no pesticides. I want no growth hormone. It's a lots of things that different segments of our consuming population want. And speaking of sustainability, I want to spend just a little bit of time on sustainability because I think our dairy industry got if you hadn't been already, we got exposed to sustainability just a few days ago with our good friends at Starbucks. 
Again, it's change. Won't be the last time. And we as an industry need to be prepared for those kinds of things and we need to be ready to talk about it. As I think about sustainability, and as I reflect on all the visits that I've made, I can say our processor members are focused on sustainability. Doing more with less, producing more product with less water, putting the water back in the environment cleaner than we took it out. Our farmers are focused on sustainability with no-till row crops, soil health, manure and waste management, use of water, use of energy, production of energy. We as an industry are embracing sustainability. And sustainability needs to be good for business. We need to sustain the businesses. But it also needs to be good for society. So we know from research what consumers think about sustainability. 59%, or roughly, six in 10, say that sustainability is important to them when they purchase a product for various reasons. Less pesticide use, environmentally friendly, and so on. Less waste. We also know that seven in 10 consumers say they're willing to pay more for a product if they think it's produced in a sustainable way. In other words, if they think it matches their values. So if we look at what does sustainability include, Animal care, it isn't a question of whether we have another video about animals and how animals are cared for on your dairy farms. It is when. And with the Farm 4.0 program and the adoption across the entire industry, a tremendous step. Many will go further than that with third-party verification and additional requirements, all part of change, all part of evolution. Environmental stewardship, land, air, water, soil, all those things are part of that. Ensuring a workforce and a workplace well-being, societal benefits, not just good for the shareholder, but also good for other stakeholders. Is it good for your employees? Is it good for your communities? Is it good for the supply chain? Is it good for society? We're seeing more and more companies, organizations take this on, and the Business Roundtable, which is the top U.S. companies, all change and increase their focus beyond just the shareholder to a broader set of stakeholders. We're all going to need to do that. Harnessing information, technology to create conditions for growth across our industry. Technology makes us more efficient. Sustainability, with a lot of our metrics, are efficiency metrics. Producing more output per unit of input plays a big role in what we do. I've given a list here, but again, the definition for sustainability is broad. I think perhaps the announcements last couple weeks from Starbucks are instructive. Their sustainability lead said basically everything is on the table. So when we think about the definition of sustainability, Perhaps we need to broaden it. And we have a fantastic panel here at Dairy Farm on sustainability. Representative from Glambia, giving us some ideas of things coming maybe from Europe and from Ireland coming to the U.S. as well as the U.S. consumers. Costco, talking about a major retailer. Nestle, a great member of the dairy industry. A global food company. And Rabobank, talking about how the finance community is thinking about sustainability and their lending practices. And we probably saw some of that driving the Starbucks decision with BlackRock involvement last week. 
Technology is, is a powerful tool. Technology is here, and technology is driving change. Technology is driving change across our industry. We think about today's farms. I tell people every day, I grew up on a farm. You talk to many people, oh yeah, I know about farms. I go, oh, well, when we had a farm? Well, I, when I was in high school, I went to visit my, my grandparents' farm. I tell people, if you haven't been on a farm in the last five years, you are out of touch with what's happening on today's farms. You have no clue what's going on to, in today's farms. It's amazing. Gene editing, we may be able to edit the horn gene out so we don't have to dehorn our young stock. Plant genetics and what we're doing with our row crops and the efficiency we're getting. It's absolutely phenomenal. Talked to a dairy farmer the other day, told me that he only keeps replacement heifers from his first and lactation, first and second lactation cows. And I said, oh, why is that? And he said, well, because the genetics of the third lactation are outdated. Think how fast that's happening. We also see technology on the farm in the terms of robotic milkers. We're doing more with less labor. We all know the issues with labor. So, as a result of technology on the farm, what's that done for us? An amazing story to tell. Basically, we produce twice as much milk with half as many cows in the last 50 years. A tremendous story. Twice as much milk, half as many cows. If we look at the production of the U.S. dairy cow today, about 23,000 pounds per cow per year. So some people will say, well, you know, Dykes is pretty good, man. You know, we probably won't do much better than that. So what will this look like in the next 50 years? I don't know, but I'm a believer and it'll look much better. Why do I say that? What basis do I have to say that? Well, we know what the capability of one cow is. The world champion milk producing cow in Wisconsin produced 78,170 pounds per year. So we've got a little ways to go from 23,000 to 78,000. So I'm a believer this will continue. Not only is this an efficiency story about milk production, we also have a great story to tell in terms of environmental impact. The last 30 years, we've produced 50% more milk with 9% less carbon emissions. We, you, as an industry, are doing great things. Technology is not just on the farm, technology is also going through our processing industry. I am a firm believer that we are in the midst of a digital transformation. The use of technology to collect data. As the price of sensors get lower, we'll have more sensors in more places. We'll collect more data. As our computing power increases, when we move from 4G to 5G, we will be 100 times faster and 1,000 times more volume. 100 times faster, 1,000 times more volume. Other industries are already doing digital transformation. We are getting there. I've talked to some of you who have looked at making these moves for three times already. But as the cost of sensors and computing power gets lower, more and more people will be doing this. We'll use data, we'll use analytics, we'll have algorithms, we'll have machine learning. We already have some machine learning. Land of Lakes has driverless trucks that's already made deliveries. That's machine learning. We'll write algorithms to help make decisions. We'll have data that will help us to understand the last time we had a positive detect of a pathogen in a finished product, these thousands of variables were lined up we'll be notified that those variables are lining up now. Go take a look at things, because it looks like what happened 10 years ago when we had a pathogen in a finished product. Imagine what capabilities that gives you. Imagine the efficiency that gives you. And we'll be continuing to produce more with less. We'll be doing it in a sustainable way. And as we do that, that means we're gonna to need to look at our markets. 
and we're going to need to embrace global markets. Dairy farmers are the absolute best I've ever seen at reading market signals. Because when price is down, what do dairy farmers do? They produce more milk. I hear some of you are already laughing. When prices are up, what do dairy farmers do? They produce more milk. What do we think dairy farmers are going to do in the future? Produce more milk. If we look at our exports, we're fairly new in the export world. We've only been doing it about two years. But we'll have to look at global markets because, yes, dairy farmers are going to produce more milk. USDA says in the next 10 years we'll have another 33 billion pounds of milk coming at us. So what are we going to do with this milk? Well, if we extend our current consumption patterns to where we are, looks like about one-third of this or 11 billion pounds will need to go to the export market above and beyond what we are today, and the other 22 billion will be in the domestic market if things continue as they are. As we think about the global markets, that means we're going to need trade agreements. So we talked about USMCA, Japan, China. We need to be looking at the other members of the TPP, Southeast Asia, for example. We're going to need trade agreements. Our competitors are aggressive in doing trade agreements. We need trade agreements that give us market access, give us a level playing field so that we can compete. It's going to be essential for us. We at IDFA, working with our trade committee, have a target list of countries that we need to see more trade agreements with. Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, you name it. We're blessed. We also have our U.S. Trade Ambassador, Greg Dowd, here with us at Dairy Farm. The folks at USTR do a tremendous job for all of us in this industry. And a little known fact, we think about an agency like USDA, they have about 150,000 people. An agency like USTR has about 220 people. You talk about working, you talk about networking, those people work, and they do a tremendous job for us. So if we think about all this change and we talked about, one thing we know is going to be required is leadership is going to be required. If we're going to take this industry forward, if we're going to do the things we need to do, if we're going to take the additional milk to a changing consumer that's our boss, leadership is going to be required. We're going to need to think about our organizations, and you heard some of that last night. Is your organization ready for today's marketplace? Can you attract and retain and develop the leadership you're going to need to take your organizations forward? One of the things I have found extremely interesting at this dairy farm already is the number of people in this audience who are leading companies and organizations and you're brand new to the dairy industry. And I think that's a wonderful thing. We need diversity of opinion. We need new perspectives. We need learnings from other organizations and other industries. And I'm a firm believer that people are going to be at the center of what we do and how we lead this change. So at IDFA, we have developed an effort, a people strategy that we refer to as the power of people. We've launched our next generation leadership class last year. And they are all here at Dairy Forum this year. So if you hadn't had a chance to meet them, meet them. These are the, the group of folks that are going to be leading our industries into the future. At this Dairy Forum, we launched the Women in Dairy Network. And I'd like to thank these two tables of our Women in Net Dairy Network Advisory Committee. Tremendous group. The interest in this is phenomenal. We've had 230 women register to join the Women in Net Dairy Network already. Diversity of opinion, diversity of view is going to matter. Goldman Sachs said this week that they're not going to take another company forward for an initial public offering unless one of the board members is a diversity person. 
diversity of gender, diversity of sexual orientation, diversity of color. We need to be ready to embrace those changes. The other thing we have is the power of people. We're very excited about this. This will be in October. The program's put together. We're working with two tremendous partners. McKinsey, helping us think through organizational structures of organizations into the future. And Egon Zender, helping us think through the people, the individuals, talent, development, leadership skills. So you'll be hearing more about these. You have flyers at your tables, et cetera. So I've talked about change, but maybe in preparing to close, change is here. Are you ready for it? It's not something that we talk about that happened in the past. It's here. So if we know it's here, Next question we'd have is how do we embrace it? How do, how do we react to it? And I think there are a few ways. We need to innovate to evolve. We all need to help our industry evolve. It's gonna take capital, it's gonna take research and development. And our industry is innovating. We need to ask ourselves the questions of, do we have the policies in place with our pricing systems, with our regulatory systems, to incentivize and encourage the innovation that we need in this industry. We need to be ready to take bold risk. We need to think in new ways. We need a diversity of opinion, a diversity of perspective, a diversity of experience and background from other industries. We're gonna to need to build coalitions <clears throat> with new allies. We can no longer rely on just agriculture going and telling people how wonderful we are and they'll say, oh God, thanks God, thank you for telling me I had forgotten how wonderful you are. That's not gonna work for us. We're gonna need to be transparent. We're gonna need to be prepared to respond to increased public scrutiny if we're gonna maintain our license to operate or our freedom to operate. We're gonna to have to diversify our product array. We're gonna to have to ask ourselves, what business are we in? We do not want to be the next Kodak. We need to ask those tough questions and we need to be prepared to answer them. And like all of our experiences, a lot of times when we get asked a question, we know the two answers to it. The one is what does our team want to hear? And the other one is what is the truth and what do they need to hear for our own benefit? And as I said before, we gotta expand our markets, not just globally, but domestically and globally. So, the power of dairy, the theme of this year's conference. As I close, we got, we've talked about changes here, we've talked about how do we embrace it. The next big question is who's gonna do that? Where is the power of dairy? Where's it gonna come from? And I would say, without a doubt, that the power of dairy is in you, each and every one of you in this room, all 1,147 of you. It's your time to step forward. I hope you leave this dairy forum having learned new things, new approaches. I hope you leave this dairy forum excited about the future and ready and willing and exercised about unleashing the power of dairy. Thank you very much. You have my commitment. I will work with you, and I firmly believe that together we are making a difference for dairy. Thank you very much. I have to say, in addition to the President's address, I have one more duty that I have to do this morning. And uh, as in all organizations, uh, sometimes these things are easy and sometimes they're more difficult. But this morning is an exciting time and I wanna take just a minute to recognize our Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, Carrie Fry, 
She's been serving our association and you as members of this industry for over two decades. She's led our association's regulatory team on food safety, food labeling, standards of identity, anything and everything related to regulatory matters with food. She's been active on both the domestic and the international front, chairing the U.S. affiliate to the International Dairy Federation, advising delegations on codex standards. Her work's been published in journals, textbooks, and her expertise and experience has invi been invaluable to our membership and to our colleagues at IDFA. Now, Carrie has earned the opportunity to retire. I cannot express enough gratitude for all the wonderful things Carrie's done. And although I'm pleased for her and I wish her the best, we'll miss her. So here's a brief video that I think tells the great story of Carrie Fry. When I think about Carrie Fry, Carrie, Carrie, Carrie. I always heard this Carrie, 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 and didn't really know what that was all about. Carrie Fry is a franchise player. She is the rock here at IDFA. Carrie has been an incredible asset for IDFA. You know, whether she was troubleshooting on nutrition labeling or a go-between on an issue with FDA or working through tedious international standards, she always gave it her very best. I tell you, it takes a special person who can, in one minute, go on Dr. Oz, talk about sweeteners, and also, that afternoon, go out and beat us in golf. We have a question, you either had an answer, got an answer, or made a committee and got it done. She's really one of those stones, one of those pillars. That's why we have such great respect, because you've always cared for whoever has an issue, you're always there for us. Carrie has also brought women together in our industry, and I love her for that. So I just wish her the very best in retirement, and love and hugs to you, Carrie. Carrie, thank you for all you've done. Love working with you. So proud to call you a teammate, and I wish you the best of everything. All the best, Carrie. Carrie, please join me. just truly honored and really overwhelmed, first of all, to have so many friends and colleagues here today recognize me for this. You know, I never imagined when I started my career in the dairy industry 40 years ago, when I was reading a Babcock milk fat test as a lab technician, or I was climbing into a stainless steel silo to do a check on sanitation that I'd have this amazing opportunity to work for IDFA, and as we say, and I really believe, make a difference for dairy. I am so grateful to Tip Tipton for hiring me and challenging me, for Connie Tipton for inspiring me, and Michael Dykes for giving me the opportunity to be a leader. I feel so fortunate to love the dairy industry and to find the love of my life, my husband Gary, through the dairy industry. It's really been a privilege to represent the dairy industry in Washington, D.C., with state regulatory agencies and internationally. I want to thank everybody, all of you, for helping me follow my dreams, being able to teach, being able to share things, help the industry, and I truly love dairy. Thank you. <laughs>